Hello and welcome to my studio. I'm Jessie and this is the Knit Up and Die podcast, episode 37, Back and on Track. Hi! <laughs> uh, sorry I missed you guys last week. I really did miss you guys last week. I had a horrible migraine. Um, I was all prepared to video and sit and chat with you guys and the pain started and the lightning bolts and then vertigo and the vertigo was so bad that I was okay if I was sitting on my sofa but as soon as I moved the whole room just like slid off and blah. so good things came of it but I missed you guys um, let me start by saying hello and thank you to my new subscribers. I did see a few new subscribers this past week while I was gone. I'm sorry, I really did miss you guys. Uh, but hello to Wendy and to Sharon. Welcome. I'm thrilled to have you guys. As always, my show, my, my podcast is about you guys. So subscribe, tell me what you want to see, and ask me questions. I'm here for you and I'm love to show techniques. I love to talk about knitting, obviously, um, and really want to build something that's interesting and resourceful for you. So have at, say hi to me. Uh, let me know what's going on. Also, I want to say hello to Stacy in New Mexico and Cricket in Illinois. Thank you for introducing yourselves in the group. It has been great getting to know a little bit about you ladies. And I'm just thrilled to see people joining my Ravelry group and talking amongst themselves and being supportive with each other. That's really what this is all about, is not just being there for knitting, but being there for our lives, for supporting each other in our day-to-day -day junk and knowing that we're not alone. Uh, our common thread, <laughs> our common yarn, is knitting. But outside of that, we have so many other things in common and we can help each other. And I, I'm thrilled to facilitate new relationships, new friendships, and new support groups for each other. So please, if you're looking for a nice, safe place to go where there's wonderful, wonderful, generous people who are going to be supportive and help you with your stuff, come join the group. We'd love to have you. Um, Let's see, I've got my cheat sheet, I'm sorry guys. Hello to Scott and John over at the Sweet Tea No Shade podcast. I love you guys. If you have not checked out this podcast, hit pause, go find it. It's called Sweet Tea No Shade. I believe they just did their, it's their third or their fourth episode. I break them up into little pieces when I watch my, my favorite podcast during my lunch break at work. So sometimes I only see 10 minutes of an hour. And so I feel like I've known these guys for years because I've seen them in a bunch of little segments. It's really probably only four episodes. They are hysterical. They are a wonderful married couple, obviously happily married. Both of them are knitters. And they just, their relationship is fabulous, it's fabulous. And they play off of each other and there is love and warmth and companionship and exploration and knitting adventures and humor. And I love it. I love it. I am a huge fan. Scott, John, mwah, love you guys. Um, and I'm sorry when I leave little tiny comments on your videos and then I watch more of the video and I learn more <laughs> and I go back and I, I nag you guys I keep sending you messages I, it's all in love um, also <laughs> a very special hello to my favorite enabler and successful sock knitter Betty Ann Betty Ann congratulations on your sock keep enabling those boys I love them um, and to I'm sorry, I'm checking my list. I'm so sorry. To David. David, you're inspiring. I love you. I am sorry that you're going through what you're going through. And just all of my love and healing energy to your brother. And I wish you nothing but the best. There. I'm all verklempt. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, th those are my special hellos this week. Thank you, everyone. And 
I, I'm inspired by all the contacts I make, by all the people I experience in this, and I hope you are too. So I, I'm always going to tell you about things that I see and that I find in the world that I love, um, podcasts that I've found. But certainly, if you found something wonderful that you'd like to share with me, contact me. I'd love to know about it. I'm always looking for new stuff. Okay, so on to, on to why you're here. Again, last week was horrific. I really wanted to do my podcast. I'm really bummed I didn't get to. Um, but like I said, I had this migraine. Good things did come of it. Um, if I sat on the sofa and didn't move my head, I could sort of get away with not experiencing the vertigo that I was suffering. And I, I could be productive as long as I didn't move. <laughs> which sounds ridiculous. Uh, I could move my hands. Ha ha, ha ha. And I didn't mind watching TV. Um, it was otherwise quiet in the house. My husband had gone off on a motorcycle ride and I had the opportunity to really just kind of binge some TV. And so I caught up on a couple things um, and I experienced some new things. I, I'm a Trekkie, I'm a Trekkie. I, geek. Um, Star Wars, the new Star Wars stuff, meh, meh, meh. Um, but Star Trek, the new Star Trek stuff, ugh. Ugh. I, I love, 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 love. Um, the, the parallel universe, the altered timeline, to see familiar storylines and look at them from a totally different angle, a different approach, Love it, love it. If there are people out there who happen to catch this podcast who are in any way capable of contacting Simon Pegg, or if Simon, if you're out there, mwah, um, keep writing, produce more. I need, I need a Star Trek movie a week, please. <laughs> I, I'm in love with them. Um, I watched the first two of the newest of the Star Trek movies as they came out and adored them, adored them. The third one that came out, I blew off. I had heard from other people out there that it was done by the guy who did Fast and Furious, that we had lost J.J. Abrams. J.J. again, mwah, love you. Um, and I just kind of was like, eh, chase scenes, and you know, not my thing, not my thing. I don't care how wonderful the actors are. If it's all just chase scenes, I, I'm not interested. A dear friend at work, my dear friend Jorge, who I love, um, kind of said, hmm, honey, you're missing out, and talked to me a little bit about it. God bless him, he doesn't do spoilers. And when I had this horrible vertigo, I thought, okay, I can knit, I can watch TV. Worst thing I do is turn it back off. We'll give it a shot. Oh, I'm so glad I did. I am so glad I did. I loved it. It was fantastic. Uh, Simon Pegg wrote it, or was one of the writers, forgive me. I'm sorry, I forgot who the other writer was. Simon can do no wrong in my life. I love everything he touches. J.J. Um, Abrams was involved in it. I believe he was the producer, he, he was involved in it. The director was the guy who did Fast and Furious. I did not have a problem with any of the scenes in it. I did not feel like there was extenuating chase scenes. I did not feel bored at any point. It was interesting. It was graphic. The storylines were good. There was still a sense of humor in it. I am thrilled by some of the tributes that were in it. Um, there was a tribute to Spock, of course, who losing Leonard Nimoy was hard. <laughs> Nobody should get this upset about losing an actor. I do. Um, he, he was just an inspiration in his personal life as well as in his acting. His philanthropy for the arts was so generous. His work in the city of Boston was just he was a great gift. He was a great gift. There's also a tribute in it to George Takai that I do 
teared up. I, I cried at Star Trek. Um, and I have since been told that he was not particularly thrilled by that tribute, but has since warmed to it. I, I just see it as an honor, um, as, as a tribute. I, I think it was important to do. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, please go watch the movie. Go watch the movie. Anywho, so while I had this horrible migraine, and maybe some of my emotional attachments and sensitivity are because I had a migraine, and it does really weird things to me. I can cry at a, a cell phone ad if I'm not careful. <laughs> um, but I just really loved the movie. I found it to be great binge knitting TV. Um, of course, I did spend like six hours on my sofa knitting and watching TV and not moving. So that was not the only thing I watched. I did fall back on some favorite movies and I, I literally binged movies back to back to back. Um, other movies consumed were uh, For Your Consideration, which is a mockumentary, uh, all, in, all in the same family, all by the same people. In Consideration, A Mighty Wind, and Best in Show. Three of my favorite mockumentaries, every one of them loaded with comedic gems, fantastic acting, fantastic work, just, just fabulous. I love them. I think I have seen For Your Consideration three times, A Mighty Wind probably eight times, and uh, I would have to say Best in Show, I've probably seen that movie 12 times. I know, I'm weird, I love them, I think they're hysterical. So I did all that. Um, I've also been watching Bomb Girls. It's a series regarding, I believe, World War II. It's placed in Canada, and it follows a, a collection of women who worked as bomb manufacturers during the war and their storylines. It is a series that my mother turned me on to. Binge through that baby. Uh, I think I watched the last two seasons in one shot. Um, fantastic actors and actresses in it, beautifully done. Not crazy over the top, um, really pretty natural storylines that are done in an interesting way. Towards the end it gets a little, I, I don't know how, it, overly fictitious, but it's an enjoyable watch, absolutely. So. Now you know what I've been watching while I knit, but you don't know what I knit. <laughs> if I haven't lost you yet, if you're not like, okay, I came for knitting and she's talking TV, let's look at the knitting. So, binge knitting on my sofa with a migraine, watching all these fantastic shows. I worked on my sweater. I had time. I had big chunks of time. And although I had this horrible migraine, I was able to wrap my head around the math for my sleeve. Oh. And I knit on it. I have a sleeve! All the way to the cuff, bound off. I have a sleeve. And I love it. And it fits. I'm really happy with it. Um, Really, I didn't have to do any hard math. I really didn't. I popped it on. I looked at how much more I had to knit. I decided to continue in the same rate of decreases that were already written into the pattern and figured I'd try it on again when I get further down and see where we're at. I knew what I wanted to end with for a cuff size. And sure enough, when I get down to here, I only needed this much before I had to do the cuff, so I worked it even. And it fits, it's beautiful, I love it, I'm very happy with it. And so, just so you have an idea how much TV I watched, I was... I was here. I was here. I had to, I had to count my repeats. I was here, so I did all of this, da da da, and... All of this. <laughs> so my sleeve, I quite literally only have, I think I did a row count. I think I've got like 42 rows to go. 
I have to do about that much right there to finish this other sleeve. I think, I think it's quite possible I could get this done for next weekend. Now, it has been 106 degrees, 105 degrees, it has been humid, it has been icky. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to try it on for 45 seconds and I'm going to block it. The temperatures are normalizing. We are coming back down to normal. I think today we're supposed to have a high of like 88. Um, so the, the crazy heat has finally dissipated. We're getting back down to normal, breathable, livable. And I don't mind so much knitting. The knitting that was done on this was done on the TV, on the sofa, under a fan, and kind of bunched up into the side so I really didn't have to touch wool because it has been hot. Um, theoretically, it'll cool down enough that I can knock the rest of this out this week, give it a final try on to make sure I don't have any other weirdo adjustments I need to do to it. So far, it's been perfect. I'm really happy with it. Um, and then I'll block it and we will have a sweater. I'm very excited. How excited am I? If you couldn't tell by the dancing, um, <laughs> I have it in my head that I'd like to knit another sweater. I don't remember falling down and I don't remember any pain in my head outside of the migraine, so I don't know that I've hit my head. Um, but clearly I have because I actually am seriously considering knitting a fingering weight sweater. I, um... I, why? Let, let's go there. Let, let's undo what's going on in my head right now. Why am I considering a fingering weight sweater? Because I want something lightweight. I want something thin and I want something drapey. Um, I don't own any sport weight yarn. I have DK, I have worsted, and I have fingering. I have a bizarre amount of lace weight that I'm not sure why I own because I don't particularly use a lot of lace weight. Every once in a while I get psychotic and I decide to knit some uber fine, highly detailed shawl and lace weight's the right answer. So I have a collection of it, but I'm not actively using it at this time. Fingering just feels like the right answer for a drapey, lightweight kind of sweater. I may beg off and go DK on it. I have some lovely DK that I dyed myself that's in a heirloom tomato colorway. It just sings to me. It's a beautiful color on me. It works well with my coloring. And I'm really tempted to pull that back out of my shop and use it on myself. I could reasonably dye up some of the heirloom tomato colorway on fingering. I haven't decided yet. I haven't decided yet. The deal I've made with myself is that I have to have this guy completely, completely done before I start another sweater. Um, I do have some events coming up this fall and I'd really like to have a hand knit sweater in my wardrobe to wear during these events. Um, so that's not until November. I know how long I've been working on this guy, so I gotta crack on. I, I gotta get that sorted in my head and started because otherwise I'm gonna cut myself short and I'm gonna end up at the last minute knitting crazy and things won't get blocked. What else have I been doing? Okay, so I told you all it's been surface of the sun hot here. So naturally, what projects do you work on? Well, a blanket, of course. I know. Um, the truth of the matter is we have a really fantastic central cooling system in the house, and it's very efficient. Why is it very efficient? We had our roof redone. Um, I think the roof was redone three, four, five years ago now. We have a swamp cooler. Other parts of the country won't be familiar with this. A swamp cooler is an evaporative cooling system. 
It is a great big cube that sits on the roof of your house. It has a pump. The pump pours water through uh, these foam or cedar or mesh pads and a fan blows through and the water in the pads evaporates and it blows this air down into your home, this, this evaporative cooled air. And it's wonderful, it's wonderful as long as it's not humid. If it's humid, it's not very effective. So the dry environment here is wonderful when the weather shifts and it's humid like it has been more recently, it's not as effective. Otherwise, it can cool your house up to 10 to 20 degrees cooler than what's outside, which is fat. When we had the roof redone, we had an old evaporative cooler, old swamp cooler on the roof, and it needed to go. It was rusted out. It was a nightmare. We had it removed. We purchased another one. When the roofers redid the collar between inside and outside of your home, they put in the wrong size. They put in a bigger collar than was appropriate for the size evaporative cooler that we purchased. We returned the evaporative cooler that we bought. We bought an evaporative cooler that fit the sleeve they put in there. And it is big enough to cool a house twice the size of our home. In order for an evaporative cooler to work, you have to have square footage, equal square footage, of windows and doors open in your house so that the air comes in through the top and blows out and cools your home. In order to run this one, we have to have every single window in the house open to use it efficiently because it's so big and it actually on the high setting will cause a significant breeze in our home. It's quite ridiculous, it's quite ridiculous, but with the roof situation what it was, there was not an opportunity to correct it. So we have a very nice system. It's very, very effective in cooling off the house. And I, I love it, I love it. Why the long story about the evaporative cooler? Well, my husband, I, I think there's something wrong with his inner thermostat because he's pretty sure that in the winter, we should be in our bathing suits and the stove should be glowing red with heat. And in the summer, there should be a stiff breeze in our house and perhaps snow. <laughs> he, he really has, he's got a very narrow temperature range of comfort and we try to achieve it regardless of the season. Um, so with the gale force winds and the snow coming off of the coolers and the fan above the sofa, I don't mind being covered in a wool blanket and knitting it. And I got some work done on it. Um, I think the last time I showed you guys this blanket, I had been going across this row. I think you guys missed maybe these last three or four squares, as well as the one and a half I've got going here. I'm making progress on it. Um, this top row, once this top row here is complete, which looks like I've got 10 and a half squares to go, I will effectively be 25% done on the proposed size for this. And that's big, that's exciting. So I really am cracking on, I really am making good progress with this. And so long as the temperature keeps up and my husband keeps the swamp cooler pegged, uh, I should be able to get some blocks done on this as well. I'm going to prioritize and I'm going to finish the sweater first before I start working on blocks of this again. Uh, just because I'm so excited to be so close to done on the sleeve of that sweater and it has been camping entirely too long. I just want to get it done. So How to Eat an Elephant is marching ahead and I'm happy with it. I feel really encouraged that I'm at 25% of the total blanket size. I've done a little bit of debating with myself as to whether I wanted to continue on that one piece or whether I wanted to break off and do another quarter separate. Uh, I mentioned my thoughts to my husband and he said, well, I see where you're coming from. 
However, if you change the end size of the, the blanket, you're not going to have the opportunity to have four equal squares. Brilliant. So I'm going to continue in the way that I am where I'm just going to keep going adding squares on to this initial piece rather than starting another piece and trying to sew them together. I, I think he's dead on. If I get further in and I decide I don't want as big a blanket or I want a bigger blanket, it'll afford me the flexibility. So cheers to husband logic. Also this week, this past two weeks rather, um, I have been working on my improvised shawl. I showed you guys how to do the cast on for the garter tab cast on for a triangular shawl so that you could just improvise a shawl. And I had a couple skeins of yarn that I was using to create that. Um, I'm looking off to the floor over here because it's blocking. I got it done. And I got it done in such a way that out of the two skeins of yarn that I was using, there was a purple and a multicolor. That is all I have left. I really, really used every every last inch with the exception of this little bit here. Um, so much so, I wanted to bind it off in the purple. I honestly did not believe that there was enough yarn here to do the bind off with. And I had saved what I thought was enough of the purple to do the bind off. I got all but 13 stitches bound off and was out of yarn. I lost yarn chicken. Um, so the tags, the yarn was Manostel Uruguay. It was the Wool Classica yarn. It's a bulky weight. It's a nice big shawl. Um, it's probably it's a triangle. It looks to be about two and a half feet deep and about five feet wide. So it'll wrap around my neck. It, it's a nice neck piece that will tuck into a coat. Um, the yarn came with these labels and the labels by chance are tied on by the yarn. I farmed <laughs> the yarn from the purple tag um, and I did a, a spit join on it, a felted join, and it bought me all but three stitches. So I proceeded to start weaving in ends and I found another segment that was about four inches long after I had woven in an end on a tail that I was able to nick off and do another felted join on. And I managed through harvesting leftover bits and tails to bind it off in the purple. It's going to be all done blocking, and I'll show it to you guys next week. It is multicolored. Um, it is stripey. I'll talk more about the rules that I gave it when I show it to you. Um, I did simple rules. My rules were whenever I worked on it, when I finished, I had to finish a row, and the next time I picked it up, I had to change colors. And that kept the segments lengths random and it kept the pattern striping. I also had an order of stitches where I started with a stockinette, I did a garter section next, and then I did a open work, a knit two, uh, sorry, a yarn over knit two together work. Um, and every time I changed, not only did I change the yarn, but I changed which segment I was doing and I stayed in the order of the segments. You'll see it next week when I show you the whole piece. Um, it, it created a really neat piece. I like it. And my husband, when I was knitting it, he'd look at it and he was like, looks kind of hippy-dippy, looks kind of clown vomity. What are you doing? And he Every once in a while, he questions my judgment. <laughs> Smart man. Um, and for a while there, I started to buy into what he was saying. Now that it is all on the blocking mats and stretched out really nice so it's giving it a good size and it's opening the open work. Even he admitted he liked it better now that he's not seeing it all bunched up. I, I think that maybe when it was bunched up it looked noisy whereas opened up now you can see the stripes and it makes more sense. That's for next week. We'll, we'll see that next week. But 
I lost yarn chicken and I did manage to salvage um, and I, I made a thing. I did a thing. That was exciting. Also, I've been carrying around travel knitting and you guys have seen this. This is my Dark Hero socks. I had deigned to make socks for my husband and I've talked about them before. I used a elastic thread that I carried along to make them extra super elasticy and stretchy because he's got these skinny little ankles and then he's got a, a high end step. So the idea was it was going to hold tight around his ankle and I was going to be able to make a sock for him. They held up for a couple weeks because I needed to stop and get him to try them on to see if I needed to increase at the ankle. Bad news is he tried them on and they did not fit. They did not fit. They fit around his, his ankle, his leg beautifully. They were nice and tight. There was a good elastic hold. He liked the fit, but getting them up over his instep, his archway, was not, it was not comfortable. It was not easy to do. It was beyond difficult. It, it was not feasible. It was not reasonable. And therefore, the socks are not his. Um, I'm knitting them for me. Um, they're tight on me as well, but not uncomfortably so. They're snug, they're snug. And I think I'm gonna really appreciate them this winter. Certainly not right now, not right now. It, it would be a weight loss program to put them on right now because I would sweat to death. But I'm finishing them up. I, I briefly considered ripping them back and thought, I'm not sure how the elastic is going to rip back out. And I don't know that it's going to be usable afterwards because it, it is, there's bits of it that are under tension and pulling it back out. I just, I didn't want to waste the yarn and I didn't want to waste the thread. So I decided to go ahead, march ahead and make myself socks, which have had good progress. There's the the heel is all turned and I'm down on the foot and I probably have another couple inches, I know they look ridiculously long, I have clown feet, um, before I start the toe and then I have a second sock to knit. They're lovely, I'm disappointed, I really did want to knit him socks. He tried to cheer me up, he reminded me that he loves his bed socks and that he certainly could use another pair of bed socks, that he loves taking them with him when he goes camping. So I'll make him another pair of, of, of house socks, bed socks. I just really wanted to make him a pair of wool socks that he could wear this winter as regular socks and I'm going to have to really sort out how to do that. His foot is just oddly shaped. He's got skinny ankles, really skinny ankles. I need to figure out how to put weight on this boy and have it collect only in his ankles. Not sure how I'm going to do that, but certainly it's that or figure out a different sock formula. I, I venture on. I will find a way. Someday I will succeed at this. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to make socks for myself. Finally, um, I think I told you guys last episode that I was blocking the Addicted to You scarf that I had done, or shawl. I, I don't even know what I'm calling it. Um, it really is more of a scarf. Here it is. It's all blocked. It's all rolled up. It's lovely. Uh, it was garter. It is a garter stitch. Um, super, super simple design. It is quite literally knit, yarn over, knit two together, and bind off. That is the extent of the difficulty of this project. You're, it's done by holding two fingering weights together which is a marling technique. You can do it with any two yarns. If you wanted, you could do it with two identical yarns. You could do it with two solids. You could do it with a solid and a variegated. You could do it with hand paint, anything you want, anything you want. So long as when you're knitting it, it gives you joy. Do whatever you want. 
So I have this, it started with this tiny little cast on and it does these teeth. I need to cut my tails. They're woven in, but they're not cut. It has these teeth on it. I'm trying to block my face so that you can see. And it just continues to grow for as long as you have yarn for. And it grows and 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 grows. And, grows. and it came out to this nice width here. I love it. I love it. I because it's garter, of course, it grew um, when I blocked it and the length ended up being longer than I am tall, which is the perfect length for a scarf if you want to keep the scarf on your body and not having it waiting and falling off. You want it to be at least your height. And I just am really thrilled with how it came out. I'm going to pop it on for just a second to show you guys. The teeth blocked out beautifully. It doesn't have a right or a wrong side, so you can just fling it around, and it doesn't matter quite how you how you lay it as long as it's the way you want it. Um, I'm really thrilled with how it came out. It was a fun knit. I am excited to do the next in my series of Addicted to You scarves, shawls, um, just because I, I the process was so much fun, and it was fun to have a challenge, to really limit my design to very basic stitches and come up with something fun and attractive at the same time. So I will be writing this up. I will be photographing it. Um, it's a matter of the temperature is going to come down just a wee bit more before we, before I stand out in the sun wearing this while my husband messes with camera settings. Uh, so. <laughs> It's coming. It, it is coming. Um, and I'm excited to get this design out to you guys. My test knitters are already very occupied. They're working on my Dumbledore's Army and my Order of the Phoenix hat. Wow, my brain. I The, the temperature has cooked me. Um, those hats are out with the, my test knitters. I am starting to get feedback from them. Thank you guys, Bex. I really appreciate you doing it. I know it's been a challenge for you this week. Everybody who's got it, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can't wait to see what you've done with the pattern um, and, and your choice of yarns and your feedback as to how you felt about it, how it fit, everything. I'm, I'm very excited to hear about it. The target date to release that is next weekend. I may, depending on what I hear from my knitters, hold off one more week. I know you guys are phenomenal. Who tasks you with knitting in the temperatures that we have seen in this country this week? I am so sorry. Um, anybody who is festering through this project for me, you're heroes. I, I appreciate every, every stitch, every stitch. Um, I would invite you all to my snowing living room if it was an opportunity. Uh, so that we can all sip wine and laugh and knit in the comfort of cool, cool air. Uh, but soldering on, I, I appreciate every one of you. So that pattern is coming. Those patterns are coming, both of the hats. And I'm really excited to have those ready for you guys. It's coming, I promise. That's it. That's it for my knitting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm glancing around to make sure that really is it for my knitting. I've done some dyeing this week. Oh, I'm so excited to let you guys know. I told you in my last episode that some dear friends of mine, Carolyn and Kate, guys, hello, I can't wait, uh, have, are, they're opening a shop. They're opening a, a yarn store in La Crosse, Wisconsin. Yes, I'm so excited. And they have placed a wholesale order with me. Woo! Um, so my yarns are going to be at Unwound this fall. So excited about this. I did spend a, a chunk of time yesterday, okay, it was 10 hours, uh, dying up part of their initial order. I've got more stock coming in. Next weekend's going to be dedicated to finishing up the initial order for them for the shop. And I want to let you all know right now, I am doing some exclusive colorways for the store. They will not be available on my Etsy shop. They will be available at Unwound only. 
if you are taking a trip or if you live in the area and you love these colorways, you're going to want to check out what's available at Unwound. There are some colorways just specifically designed for the store. Just, I'm so excited for them. I'm so excited for them. And I thought it would be really fun to have colorways that you could only get there. So, very excited. I've had a lot of fun dyeing those up and creating a whole new uh, recipe book specific to their shop. And I, I can't wait for them to open. I have already hosied my spot on their sofa. I, I have a spot and someday I'm going to be in that shop and I'm going to march in, tell whoever's sitting there that they are in my spot and plunk my butt down and enjoy a cup of coffee with the girls. Can't wait, very excited to do that. Um, so that's that's in the upcoming, and certainly I'll be telling everybody about that if and when that happens. Upcoming also is um, my son lives cross country. He's over in the Boston area. He lives with his dad. He comes out every summer to visit me. He is uh, he's a knitter. He is 16 years old, and. I am very excited about his visit this year. It's always such a good time. Uh, conversing long distance with your children is, is communication, but it's never the same as having them with you. And I'm just really excited about the visit. That's coming up very soon. Um, I may end up skipping a week and not filming while he's here. Or, I may have a guest host. Um, as a knitter, as a young male knitter, he has a different perspective on the art. Um, I, I am so glad that I taught him to knit. I'm so glad that on his own he recognizes the benefits of knitting, of what it does for his brain, what it does for his stress level. Um, that he has no problem defending his art. Uh, he, his dad is a very loving and supportive person. However, his father does tease him from time to time about his granny knitting. And God love my son. <laughs> when he does tease him about his granny knitting, my son continues to work on his projects and merely retorts back to his father that he is unskilled. <laughs> I just love this kid. Um, not for him slamming or being disrespectful to his father, but because he has no problem uh, defending himself and defending something that he loves. And that is, that's a life skill and not one you can easily teach. So have that kid. Um, there, there is the possibility that you will get to meet my son and that uh, he'll be able to share a little bit of his perspective. I have not talked to him about that opportunity yet. I'm going to leave that completely in his hands. That's about him and his comfort level. Um, but I, I would love the opportunity to do that with you. And if not, certainly I, I may film alone or I may skip a week. And certainly I know you all understand that I'll be spending time with my son and will be forgiving of that. Um, so that may be coming along. <laughs> and that's the only other planned outages I have, barring any more migraines. I'm not sure what triggered it. I really never know what triggers it. People tell me that they have food allergy triggers or that they have I, I don't even know what other people's triggers are. Stress triggers, hormone triggers. I think mine are hormone related. I've never been able to really peg it down. Some people say, oh, I know three days before. I'm driving right past the road signs. Apparently, I have no idea. They're always blindsided and surprised. So um, I am getting a little bit better at not trying to... I think I'm a superhero. And whenever there's weakness afoot, I just soldier on and I'm, I'm learning to give in and take a pill a little bit sooner so yes I can be taught so barring that I, I think those are the only other potential outages I have coming up um 
why are you here today? You're here today because I generally offer up information and techniques, not just blather on about my personal life and my knitting, which that's what it is. So I actually have a technique for you folks today. Um, I'd like to talk to you guys today a little bit about lifelines. Lifelines were something that I discovered early on in my knitting and I'm super grateful that I did. They are incredibly useful and it's something that I generally include in my classes when I do teach knitting because they're more than just safety nets. They are useful tools for counting off repeats and certainly they're huge. It's called a lifeline for a reason. It's your safety net. It is breathing life back into a project after it's gone wrong. It's it's everything. It's a brilliant tool. The hardest part of lifelines is remembering to do them and not being overly proud or overly confident and choosing not to do them. What is a lifeline? A lifeline is kind of like when you're typing a document and you hit save before you're done. You have a point that you can go back to when your computer crashes and everything deletes. Lifelines are the same thing. You're creating a space that you can drop back down to when you know your work has been done correctly and you're at a safe spot. How do you do this? Well, you got a bit of knitting. It can be on any needle. Doesn't matter what needle you're using. You're going to simply thread through another line while it's still on the needles. That line is just going to live in your work and you're going to proceed past it. Just let it sit there. If it all goes horribly wrong, you'll have the opportunity to simply pull your needle out, rip back to that line, and slide it back onto the needles. Brilliant. Without having to try and catch loops or try and figure out is this stitch on this row or this row, it's all just saved for you. It's all in one place. Let's show how to get those on. So there are some fabulous, fabulous tools out there for inserting lifelines. And what material would you use for a lifeline? You can choose to use a contrasting yarn. I do that from time to time. I try to use a yarn that is thinner than the yarn I'm working with. So if I'm working with a bulky, I'll use a worsted. If I'm working with a worsted, I'll use generally a fingering. And if I'm using a fingering, I'll drop all the way down to da -da -da, dental floss. Minty fresh, keeps your knitting fresh, and is horrifically abundant. Go to the dollar store, you can generally pick up a two pack of 100 plus yards for a buck good deal. And stores neatly, has its own cutter, and is not a big addition to your knitting tote bag or your, your notions kit. Just a thing of good old fashioned dental floss. This will work just as well with bulky as it will with fingering. You can use this on anything and you don't feel like you're wasting other yarn or having to find waste yarn or carry waste yarn. You just have one neat little container. You don't even have to cut it until you're done putting it in your project. Now, if you're using a regular straight needle, you have two options for adding your lifeline. Your first option, and the one I'll demonstrate first, is using a regular old darning needle. Darn it, darning needle. And your dental floss. Leave it still attached. Thread your darning needle with the dental floss. Ta da! And simply run it through the stitches, one stitch at a time, two stitches at a time, whatever you're comfortable with. And I'm just going to pop this up in front of the camera and show you blindly from the back running it through. Just run it along the needle, pull it through, and repeat the process until you're all the way across. Da, 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 da. 
couple stitches at a time and just keep going until you're all the way across. When you're all the way across, you can drop it off the darning needle. You can snap off the end of your dental floss. And then you can take the two ends and tie them together loosely so that they're not tangling up. And just keep working on your project. Yeah, it's going to take a couple minutes for you to thread a needle and to run it through your stitches, especially if it's a larger project. But when you're all said and done, this really isn't going to get in your way and it's going to save you later if you have to rip back. Not that big a deal. Not up for threading a needle, not interested in running it through stitches, not a problem. We have other cheats. Pull it back out. You get a straight needle or you have a fixed needle. You don't want to use a darning needle. You want to insert. You can. Back to the dollar store. Tape. Good old-fashioned scotch tape. One piece. Dental floss. You can either, if it's a small project like this, scrunch it all to one end, tape the piece onto your needle, flat in line with the needle, oops, all the way up as close to your work as you can. Wrap that around and slide your stitches over that section of the needle. Easy peasy. Take the tape back off the other end, which of course I've sealed in such a way that that's going to be close work. There it is. Little piece of tape was wasted. No lemurs were harmed. Can't get it off my fingers. There's the other end. I've run it all the way through all the stitches that fast. Easy peasy. Again, tie up the ends, pull it aside, keep working. Easy. Bit of dental floss and scotch tape and you've put that in in a matter of seconds. Why aren't you doing this? Are you overconfident? Are you sure you won't make a mistake? Is the universe going to laugh at you later? Absolutely. Absolutely. It has laughed at me a hundred million times. I have screwed up stockinette <laughs> and wished I had put in a lifeline. Uh, working lace or working repeats, that lifeline acts as a counter for you. You can see immediately what row it's in and you can see how many more stitches you have to go uh, sorry, rows you have to go before you do your next action. You also, if you have a number of repeats, say you have to do 15 repeats, you're going to be able to just count the sections between the threads. It's a fantastic tool. Now, some needles, some needles are super cool, especially these interchangeable ones. Some fixed needles also have this feature. Not all interchangeables have it, not all fixed have it. This particular needle has a hole in it. Don't know if you can see it at all. That hole very conveniently accommodates dental floss. Simply thread your dental floss through the hole and either slide your stitches around or work your stitches around and it's going to thread it through for you. You don't even have to think about it. It just loads them onto the stitches for you. Easy, easy, easy. Um, certainly with the tape method like I was showing you here, you can actually tape the thread onto your working needle and knit them on past. Um, all, all of these are an option. This works with a circular fixed needle as well where you can tape the dental floss just past the join uh, or the taper here on the needle. Right here I'm talking about on the smaller part. You can tape it right there, work your next row, and pull it off, and there you are, you're, you're threaded on. So what happens when it's time to rip back? 
That's the trick. Um, it's just as easy as ever. So I'm going to tape this one back on. I'm going to load it back on. I probably shouldn't have taken it off quite yet. Give me just one second here. I'll show you how fast this really is. All I'm doing is threading this uh, lifeline back on. I, I took it off prematurely to showing you how to reload this. There we go. Also, if you're smart enough, when you tape it on, if you leave a tail that's not taped, you can actually hold the bottom that's not taped and the top that's not taped and pull and it cuts through your tape and it makes the tape easier to pull off your needle. I say as I then struggle with the tape. There we go. So here it is, it's on the lifeline. Needles out. I've been knitting, I've been knitting past my lifeline. I made a mistake. I have taken my needle out and I have pulled back down. You can only pull so far. It will stop when you get to your lifeline row. That simple. You cannot pull out past your lifeline row. Then you simply take your needle and follow the lifeline back through. It's all right there. And it tells you which direction every stitch goes in. You're back on. The one warning I have for you, especially if you're doing like a tape or you're doing the through the whole thread through, if you're adding a lifeline and you're not using a darning needle, you're not putting it through stitch through stitch, pay attention to your stitch markers. If you thread a lifeline through and you have fixed stitch markers, your lifeline's going to go through your stitch markers and they are then permanently attached at that point. You will not be able to knit past that point with your stitch markers. If you have stitch markers in your stuff, make sure that they are either removable stitch markers or that you use a darning needle and you skip your stitch markers when you run your lifeline. That's it. That's all. It's simple. It's so simple. We do not have an excuse not to use them. Um, certainly if you're in a project that's new to you or if you're in a project that it would be helpful, helpful for you to count repeats in or if you're in a stitch that's new to you, give it a try. I, I think that this simple, simple technique may save you hours and hours of work later. It doesn't have to be difficult to throw a lifeline. Like I said, simply tape and dental floss can be the answer. Um, and, and it's as simple as just running it over. That's it. That's your technique for today. I hope that you find this useful. I hope if you uh, had used lifelines in the past, maybe you saw a new way to throw them that was interesting to you or made your work easier. And if you have other questions about other techniques out there, holler. I would love to demonstrate them for you. That's it. I loved seeing you guys this week. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me last week. And I can't wait to see you next week. Bye, guys.